Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 16th Fennec Elliott webinar. My name is Stacey Sinclair, and I'm the head of technology and innovation here at Fennec Elliott, and I'm um, alongside our partner, Jeremy Glover. Jeremy is an expert in all things dispute resolution, uh, FIDIC, BIM, he's also an adjudicator, and a member of the examiner's board um, at the Center for Construction Law at King's College London. We're delighted to have so many of you joining us today. It is it's now essentially spot on six months from the start of the UK's uh, first lockdown, now possibly facing a second lockdown. And so it's perhaps the perfect time to reflect on how the construction and legal industries collectively have reacted and adapted to the challenging environment in terms of dispute resolution and dispute avoidance. So on today's agenda, perfect, we are going to discuss, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, great, uh, on perfect. On today's ad um, agenda, we're going to discuss dispute resolution and dispute avoidance. What has changed over the past six months? What's happened? Um, and how has technology um, helped to adapt and transform over those six months? So I'm gonna give a brief overview of that. And then Jeremy is going to give us a, a, a really deep dive into um, case law, lessons learned, and, and top tips that Fennec Elliott has seen um, along the way. So before we begin, um, just a reminder, you should by now see on the right-hand side of your screen the questions box. Please do, as we go, put questions in there. We will get to as many of them as we can at the end and we will deal with them anonymously. So, so don't hold back. Um, do raise anything that you want us to address. So, there we go. Um, what's happened since March, 2020? Well, largely on the whole, I'd say business as usual. It's not without its challenges, um, but really dispute resolution has carried on in all, really all of the dispute resolution forums. Um, solutions have been found to the, to the obvious problems of working at home, um, accessing justice, accessing advice. Um, so we're, we're seeing really new solutions develop and indeed there's examples out there of new ventures starting for um, resolving disputes. Just one example has been the CIR and the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution, CEDAR, have joined together and they've created the Pandemic Business Dispute Resolution Service. Um, I won't go into detail, but that's a service for disputes between 5,000 pounds and 250,000 pounds for pandemic related disputes. And they've got, they've got different options of um, mediation, of fast track um, arbitration, and helping to assist um, negotiating contracts. So um, there's different um, solutions out there that, that we're seeing. Um, there's, so there's these challenges um, as well as opportunities, and we'll come on to that uh, in a moment. What's changed? I mean, really from my perspective, we're really seeing um, a good use of technology now to enable both dispute resolution and dispute avoidance. Uh, you know, the, the virtual hearings, the virtual meetings, used in both mediation, arbitration, and litigation are now very familiar, widely used. Um, we're seeing more and more guidance and protocols being published, either to, a sub, either to supplement existing ones, um, because video conferencing is, you know, is not new to arbitration, but now we're seeing clear frameworks being established and, and protocols being agreed between the parties um, and, and standard uh, protocols as such. And I've, I've listed a few there, the ICC guidance notes, CIR guidance, guidance note, the SOL protocol, and there's others. We're, we're also seeing you know, cost savings um, in certain dispute resolution forums. You obviously you don't have the travel that you did previously. Um, there's a really a, a good significant move to electronic documents now. Um, so there's various, in, um, areas where there is the potential for cost savings. And then, you know, it's not without its challenges over the past six months. Of course, in certain aspects, there might be productivity and efficiency challenges. Um, in, other, in other aspects, actually, there, there's a savings and we are seeing, you know, the use of technology uh, and otherwise to actually help in those areas. Um, just to briefly, before I pass over to Jeremy, just to, to go through some of these 
dispute resolution um, procedures and what we're seeing from a from a Fennec Elliott perspective. Uh, in adjudication, and, and that being the, the short and sharp, I, I, construction adjudication, the short and sharp 28-day process, unless agreed otherwise, um, where you get a decision by an adjudicator at the end. Um, on the whole, very little difference between now and pre-COVID. Um, initially, back in sort of March, April, possibly May, a little bit of squabbling about the timetable um, and so forth. Um, but now on the whole, you really can't use COVID as an excuse to hide behind. And I've put on the slide there, you've got the Chris Mill developments um, versus Waters, which was back uh, a judgment in, from April. And in that case, the judge refused to grant um, an injunction to prohibit Waters from continuing on in the adjudication. And in that in that case, the, the homeowner homeowners waters um, commenced the adjudication and the contractor said, uh, can't do it, my solicitor's too busy, I can't access particular documents and so forth because of COVID. And the judge said, the judge said no, um, the parties could have agreed an extension. There are other means that you should try um, and, and, and those are not good excuses. So, we know there, on the whole adjudication, generally speaking, on the papers procedure, um, is is still carrying on, you know, largely as normal. There is, a, I would say, a significant shift away from the hard copy documents. Um, you know, a lot of reasonable um, decisions being taken. It's not to say that the hard copy documents have entirely gone, um, but it, there's a real, a noticeable shift away from the hard copy documents in the in the current environment to transfer big data pleadings um, efficiently and effectively. Uh, with mediation, again, um, vir virtual mediations are now commonplace. Uh, there's many online platforms out there that are tried and tested and well used. You have the um, breakout room facility available with Zoom and Starleaf and the others. So you're still seeing, you know, very many successful mediations as usual. If you have a dispute that, you know, had a good chance of settling, there's no reason why an, an online mediation would prevent that. You know, if, if the dispute possibly didn't didn't have, a, you know, a chance for success, you know, the online platform probably isn't going to assist or, or or otherwise in that. Um, but 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 I should say that you know possible issues with the online mediation can include, you know, with a mediation, it's, there's a real human element to it. And with virtual platforms, you know, they're not going to, you know, necessarily get that real human connection. And, and in fact, you know, if you were ahead of physical mediation, you'd have that trip to the toilet um, and pass by somebody and, you know, have a quick ad hoc conversation on the fly. You're not going to get that in an online mediation. So you're not going to be able to, you know, collaborate on the side or have those quick discussions. So a bit of a drawback there. So you can feel a bit remote and distanced from the people that you're trying to um, collaborate with. Um, Jeremy's gonna go into detail in, in, into litigation and arbitration. Um, I just wanted to say that again, virtual hearings are now commonplace. Again, online platforms and providers cater for those breakout rooms and transcriptions and the online bundle, the online electronic bundles and again, you see challenges as well as opportunities. Um, you know, puts in some instances, possibly better access to justice, um, arguably. So, I mean, when that when when in back in March and April, um, I mean, it was a real. Uh, the courts were a real, really, tr you know, did a spectacular job, really within the first week or two, um, coming out with the Lord Chief Justice's message, the uh, various different the corona the coronavirus acts. Act and regulations, the practice directions, and you know the, the the protocol regarding remote hearings. You know all within the space of weeks to really enable that access to justice and to 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 carry on. And their approach really was, particularly in the the TCC, the Technology and Construction Court, was to keep calm and carry on. You know they used Skype and they continue to do so and and other technologies. And in the TCC, which Jeremy will go into in further detail. Um, you know, if, if you want to compare um, April to September 2020 versus 2019, indeed, there's an increase in reported judgments um, if, if you compare these two years. So, so activities certainly did, did not stop. And um, back in May, uh, we had a webinar just on virtual hearings. And 
we were joined by Mrs. Justice Fiona O'Farrell, and these were her four key, you know, takeaway points, which you know really resonate and entirely agree with. And you know, she really did, you know, um, you know, adhere to that the use of technology to improve the efficiency and cost of legal proceedings, you know, without co compromising justice. But there is a recognition that in certain situations, you know, physical hearings will still be appropriate. And remember, this is the TCC. There are other courts out there, particularly say the family courts, where and, and children are involved, where where a, a virtual hearing just is not appropriate for for fairness and other um, um, reasons. So you know, perhaps we are in in a bubble in the construction industry in the sort of keep calm, carry on, business as usual. Um, but um, on the whole, it's been really really well supported by um, the courts. Um, just briefly, before I pass over, on the on the dispute avoidance side of it, the the projects, the contract, the advice, it really has been a, you know a tech enabled six months. You know there has been a, a you know a mindset a mindset um, change, um, a change in way people a, a approach projects and collaboration and communication using the the tools and the platforms that we have available to us. And it, it's interesting actually because it's it's in some cases. It's not you know new technology. It's it's this it's the um, technology that we have, and now we're now we're using it because we have to because we have to 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 survive as it were. Um, as you know, so a real a real rise in um, tools, how you can communicate better. So how we communicate with our clients um, um, and and collaborate, come up with ideas, solutions as to how to to do X, Y, or Z. Um, and then there's a lot of um, tools now that are really coming into their own with the, the automation of contract formation, um, the execution of contracts, um, tools out there that you can manage um, risk and analyze contracts, um, workflow automation, which is which is very important actually. I mean, I am talking about you know, tech enabled um, um, procedures here, but um, let's not forget that um, innovation does not necessarily need tech and to collaborate and to communicate, you know, you, you can just pick up the phone, which, which people are, are need to be doing. Um, and, and really a good use now of, of technology, which looks at project and matter analytics, really getting data driven decisions, um, because I think people are now sort of minded to um, you know, their, their minds are opening up and engaging a bit more with technology because they're, they're having to, you know, working from home. Um, one thing with, um, over the past six months, I just want to say um, the execution of contracts and deeds, obviously a lot more e-signing going on now. Um, I won't go into detail in, into this slide because you will have seen, possibly may have seen our last webinar on the 10th of September. Um, where we went through um, the ins and outs of, um, of e-signing and some issues you might want to be aware of, but we're seeing a lot, a lot more of this now in terms of the execution of, of contracts. Um, and finally, just, just a, just a quick um, point, if I may. I mean, when we started back in, you know, March and April in this environment, it really was about utilizing technology to, to continue with dispute resolution to enable um, access to justice. And then it, it seems to me that everyone became more familiar, more open to trying, more you know, engaging with various different um, things to get their job done. And now, um, now that we've had this sort of transformation of culture, of mindsets and of workflows, it's now coming into a second and third phase in my view, where now it's actually capturing those workflows and doing things more efficiently and more productively, um, which, is, which is quite exciting, I think, where we are at now. And um, just finally, so when we started this pandemic, I'd say, you know, the problem is obvious, you know, how do you carry on? And we were looking at various different solutions. And now I think we're returning to actually finding the problem because with all of this technology, with all of this um, collaboration, you need to use, you need to find the use case because there's lots of technology out there. There's lots of um, solutions, but but what is it you actually want to fix? What is it that you want to make faster and more productive? And I think it's really exciting that we're now, you know, working through um, um, the sort of initial, if you want to call it shock, um, and now and, and, now, and now getting on with it, as it were. Um, and and finally, I have been talking about technology, but let just let's not forget that it is about people and collaboration and the and the process. 
for both dispute resolution um, and dispute avoidance. And with that, I shall um, hand over to Jeremy. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Stacey. Um, and continuing with Stacey's themes, and remember we are con con concentrating on construction-related issues, disputes in the construction centre. Um, and then have a quick refresh and going back to the courts. And Stacey um, talked about the um, the amendments to the civil procedure rules that were brought in in uh, April as a temporary measure. Uh, and the thing about these is that they um, currently affect until the 30th of October only. So it's likely that these are going to have to be um, extended. And the other issue, and Stacey, could you move my slides on, please? Um, and the other issue about them is the thing that we've noticed from time to time um, is the courts do take into account the impact of COVID-19 when considering any application, to be honest. And there'll be two or three examples that I'll talk about as we go through the slides. The Stanley and London Borough of Tam Tower Hamlets case is a good example. The claimant tried to pull a fast one and, and issue a sneaky judgment in default of acknowledgement of service when the the, the London, London Borough of Tower Hamlets wasn't actually staffed properly. And unsurprisingly, and just as you would hope, the courts took a dim view of that and they wouldn't allow the claimant to get away with it. But it's good that it's there in a practice direction. They can take into account the impact of COVID. Now, and the danger is that the courts will get very busy. The existing caseload pre-COVID-19 was heavy and it's been made worse by the delays that are caused by the physical closure of the courts. The courts, as Stacey said, are being very proactive and their approach is to proceed with as many listed hearings as possible um, and, and to have as many of those where possible um, virtually. And that could be by video, Skype, business, or it could even be by, as Stacey said, the old fashioned telephone. And, and it's interesting that when myself and Stacey were preparing these slides, we both realized that um, the key issue that there'd be more court judgments and reported on Bailey in the TCC this year than they had last year. Um, and it's just it's a symbol of how busy the courts are and also how well adjusted they've been to the current situation. And there's a high percentage of those cases are adjudication related. And anecdotally, my own experience, both sort of dealing with cases and also number of applications you see for appointment or nomination as an adjudicator, is that there seem to be more adjudications around. And of course, the TCC making use of virtual hearings, if you look at their standard directions, um, they use Skype for business. A good practical point, they try and make people sign in 30 minutes before the actual hearing. And that's good practice for any any sort of tribunal hearing, just to make sure that all the links work. You do need to test these things out. But the end of the, um, the TCC guidance for enforcement says, although the court hearing is being conducted remotely, it remains a court hearing. The usual rules and form formalities continue to apply. And I would note that comment in particular. Um, and take note of any application or order particularly orders made by your judge. And be careful what you do with any Zoom or, T or Teams link, because the hearings may be virtual, but the rules are going to be the same. Um, there's a case called uh, Gubarov, um, and when the case came to a hearing because of the COVID-19 social distancing requirements and working restrictions, they actually needed a second courtroom. And that was in use, and a feed was provided to that court using Zoom. And the judge said, and he made an order, that subject to certain restrictions, live streaming of video and order, uh, no, audio was prohibited. But for three days of the hearing were live streamed to a number of individuals outside the jurisdiction. And some of these people were actually in the States um, and they hadn't got the court's permission and there was no application made to do that. Um, and the court took quite a dim view of this. A hearing is not a live streamed event unless the court decides to do so. Um, and the point here is it's very, very easy. You get an email invitation with your Zoom link or your Teams link. It's, it's very easy, very tempting to forward it on to other people. 
but you can't do that unless you are allowed to do that. The court has control of recording of images and sounds of what goes on in the court. And one reason for this is that once that control is taken away, um, what might happen? And you don't want your images from your hearing or sound bites from your hearing, whether it's court or arbitration, to appear on social media. So it's a sort of basic common sense golden rule, always follow court orders. I mean, you almost shouldn't have to say that. But the court here was very critical of those who had responsibility for organising the hearing um, and who had misunderstood, shall we say, um, what the court was required, requiring. And of course, um, virtual hearings can cause problems for everyone, um, including the, the judges. In this family case, I mean, it's almost a case of there but for the grace of God go I. Um, there was a closed laptop, but although the laptop was closed, the remote link to the courtroom remained open and the judge had a call. And <clears throat> those in the court overheard her private conversation. Um, and unfortunately, her private conversation was about one of the witnesses and the judge made clear and up her frustrations with the witness who she said was pretending to have a cough, was, was playing every trick in the book. Now this led to um, the case having to be re reheard, but it's another golden rule of virtual hearings, um, virtual meetings, virtual mediations. Ensure when there's a break that your laptop is shut down and ensure that your phone and tablet are shut down. The virtual app has this annoying habit of staying open on a phone elsewhere, even if your laptop is shut down. Um, and here there was an issue with witnesses. Um, and speaking of witnesses, well, if there's a break, and of course another thing about virtual hearings is that they have more breaks because it is actually more tiring for those involved on a hearing. One thing that we might not have thought in March is that actually sitting, being part, participating in a hearing or a meeting on laptops all day is actually a little bit more tiring and on the, on the people there than it would be in a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so you have more breaks, but if you have a break and witnesses are giving evidence, remember that well-known rule that, that when giving evidence during the break, those giving that evidence shouldn't speak to anyone about their evidence. Well, this is what happened in the Yeovil and Stepping Stone case. It's another case in the last month from the TCC and the call was overheard probably because the system was still up and running and not everyone had shut down their laptops. And everyone overheard that there was a private phone conversation about how the witness was getting on. Now, the judge um, was very fair. He said it's not entirely clear what was said, although the transcripts and the notes there on the slide for you all to read um, will give you an idea of what actually passed between the individuals concerned. And the judge said with shall we say, judicial understatement that this was an unfortunate episode. And he reminded everyone that guarding against the obvious risk of contamination of a witness's recollection of events is the reason why there should be no consultation with others while it's being tested in the witness box. And so the golden rule arising out of that is the golden rule that existed in any event. But again, there's a temptation when you've got virtual proceedings, it's easier to be communicating with each other. But you've also got to remember to turn things off so that this particularly applies to something like mediation or commercial face to face meetings so that your comments aren't accidentally heard by the people you don't want them to be heard. Um, and other issues that have been cropping up that apply just as much to face to face hearings as they do to any virtual hearing. Um, and this is what happens in my final example. Now, as I've already said, a notable feature of the commercial court, construction court hearings, is when they do take place at court, they're often spread over a number of courtrooms. And this is what happened in the BHP case. And here, they were actually spread over four of the courtrooms up in Manchester. And you see, there's another reason why there are gonna be increasing delays in court hearings. Um, so there was that particular issue. And again, they're being re relayed to other courts via video link. Um, but what actually happened, what the judge's complaint was, was a more a more traditional one. Um, the judge was concerned about the reactions of um, one of the sides sitting behind counsel. Um, now the judge said that he'd been listening attentively to, to the submissions, but he was rather put off by the persistent, noisy and undignified sideshow of those sitting on the other side of the court. And as the transcript reveals, 
um, the judge actually told the people to shut up. Um, now, the golden rule here, as I suppose Lady Gaga might say, is if you're sitting behind those at the court, poker face. Nothing new, but it does also apply to virtual hearings and virtual meetings. In a remote hearing, if your camera is switched on, everyone can see your reaction close up. So something you do need to bear in mind. Um, switching to actual economic impact of the um, pandemic, um, it's obviously a bit early to be predicting what the ultimate economic outcome is going to be. But one issue that's beginning to crop up in the courts, um, security for costs. What if someone brings a claim and there's no guarantee that they can pay the costs of the defendant if they lose that claim? In that instance, you might be able to ask the claimant to provide security up front for your costs. And this happened in a case about pipelines. Um, the question is whether or not to order security. It's going to be considered at the date of the hearing. And the claimant said here, well, my business is a successful one. If you look at my business over the last two or three years, it's going well. It's trading well. Now, of course, the pandemic has led to a drop off in quarries, but I'd say it's about 10 percent. No orders have been cancelled. So I'd expect to be able to, to pay those costs. Um, the defendants asked the judge to consider the effects of the looming economic downturn of the global pandemic. And the judge said, well, I am prepared to consider the economic impact of the pandemic, but general evidence is not enough. It's not enough to say, well, the economy's got a lot worse, which it has um, because of the pandemic. You need specific evidence. Is there a real risk of non-payment by this particular company? And so here, he said, you haven't provided specific evidence. Yes, we all know there's an economic downturn, but the specific business of this client, of this particular party, related to the maintenance and installation of pipes and pipelines, a specific point. Um, and that's actually relevant to construction disputes as well, because there's a related issue here in adjudication enforcement cases, the Wimbledon and Vago point. Um, the idea that a party receives an adjudicator's award, but they may not be able to repay that award if it's overturned in subsequent litigation or arbitration. It's a point that's often raised by paying parties. It's, it's very rare that a court will impose a stay. And there are a number of reasons for this. If the arguments are finally balanced, the courts will find in favor of the party that won the adjudication. The courts say it doesn't matter um, what matters it doesn't matter if the party's financial position is the same today as it was um, two years ago when the contract was entered into, um, because the, the parties entered into the contract bearing the risk of those parties' um, financial positions at the time. But of course, there's a new issue, and um, what is the financial impact of um, the COVID pandemic? And again, it's something that the courts will take into account. And this is what happened in the Brosley case um, earlier this year, again, in the TCC. Um, but again, you've got to remember where the burden of proof lies. If you're the one saying, well, they can't pay because of the COVID-19 pandemic, you've actually got to provide some proof. And it's not enough to say there's been an economic downturn. So it's interesting that the courts will take these things into account, but they are looking for specific information. They're looking for specific examples, and that has to be fair enough. You can't speak in terms of generalities. Um, and one of the issues that people did speak a lot about um, in March, um, probably in April and May too, and possibly we all spoke about it too much, um, was force majeure. Was the COVID-19 pandemic a force majeure event or not? And I think we all probably decided that depending on what the contract said, it was. Um, certainly, I think that would be my view, and I think it's most people's view. But court decisions are still very rare. Um, there have been one or two in France. There's a case in Paris, the Commercial Court and the Court of Appeal, um, two energy providers, EDF and TDE. Now, France, civil law country, Article 1218 of the Civil Code deals with force majeure, but they went to the definition of force majeure in the contract, extraneous, irresistible, unforeseeable, and it also talked about the reasonable economic conditions that were prevailing. Now, 
I think wholly unsurprisingly, the judge said it was a force majeure event. The spread of the virus was extraneous to the parties, irresistible, unforeseeable, because it was sudden. Uh, and in relation to the slight economic twist at the end of the clause in the party's uh, contract, the judge noted that there was, had been a disruption affecting economic conditions, which resulted in significant losses right out of the, rising out of the performance of the agreement. Um, and there's also been a case in the bankruptcy court of Northern Illinois. Um, and again, the courts took a fairly predictable practical approach to whether or not there had been a force majeure event. Here, government executive orders on how the, the restaurant could um, operate had hindered their ability to perform. Um, they couldn't operate normally. And in fact, the restaurant's business was restricted to business takeout and curbside pickup um, and delivery. Now that's a particularly important point because the other thing we all talked about when we talked about force majeure um, was mitigation. It's not just enough to say I'm being adversely affected by the force majeure event. You've got to be able to mitigate your losses. And here, if the restaurant had offered food for delivery and takeout, that would have given at least 25% of its income. So of course, I think I've been talking a lot about um, courts and the impact of the courts. That's because the courts are more public. We, we get to find out what their judgments are. There have been a number of virtual hearings in arbitration. Um, I think it's very true of the arbitration tribunals and institutions. They reacted promptly they, to ensure that arbitrations could continue, to ensure that hearings could continue. Um, and one reason for that was most arbitration institutions were already pretty well placed to do this. And all they needed to do was tweak their rules. And you may have seen over the last couple of weeks that the London Court of International Arbitration have introducing new rules. Now these take effect in beginning of October next week. And the changes were made with a, a light touch. And they were made with a light touch because they already made provision for the key components of uh, virtual hearings. There was lots of provision for electronic communication. Well, that continues. And the rules already allowed for the tribunals to hold virtual hearings. What's happened is that the rules have been changed to, there's now a change in emphasis. Um, and that's very, very important from a tribunal's point of view, because you need to ensure the jurisdiction of the tribunal. You need to ensure that the rules allow for there to be a virtual hearing. And that's the same with dispute boards. Now, once again, practitioners have adapted. Site visits are happening remotely, maybe with the help of drones, and hearings take place too. And again, as with the LCA, guidance has been um, produced. The DRBF has produced best practice guidelines for virtual dispute board proceedings, and they deal with site visits and hearings. There's a checklist, um, and they deal with contractual housekeeping. Um, and they also deal with practical points, dealing with documents. How do you deal with people on a hearing or in a, a site visit? So there's good practical advice. Um, now, I would say that um, because I helped draft them, of course. Um, so they're bound to be um, um, excellent guidelines, um, but they do cover things. Um, it's important, these sort of contractual issues. Um, is the right to hold virtual proceedings covered in the contract documents? Is the right to hold virtual proceedings, is that allowed by local regulations? But it's also the practical stuff, ensuring that you're actually in the right camera shot, ensuring that your notes are not um, in camera shot. Things that you sort of sometimes very easy to forget about, as some of my examples from the court um, had shown. Um, and finally, a word about construction contracts. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the need for responsible and fair contractual behavior. Um, and to be honest, that's what should be happening anyway. Um, but, no, no, but it's fair enough to emphasize the importance of that in the current climate. And there's been a number of guidance notes produced. Um, as we all know, the UK government has produced guidance. The CLC have produced guidance about contractual disputes and um, collaboration. And they're all key key issues and key, key things that we need to think about. Um, how can we actually avoid disputes? How can we actually work together? And as Stacey was saying, a lot of that is about collaboration and it's also about communication. Um, the JCT too um, have produced their own guidance notes. Again, they came out very recently. Um, 
and they were very approving of what the CRC and what the government have been saying. Um, they did make the interesting point that the government has deep pockets and probably deeper uh, pockets than most companies and most employers. And to some degree, that might constrain the ability of people to um, carry on without coming to um, agreements. You can't push, you can't keep kicking the can. There's going to come a time where you're going to have to come and negotiate um, your agreement. And what the JCT made the point, so that's something that's actually quite important and something to remember, is that um, even though you're negotiating and collaborating and doing your best to deal with these things, um, it's imperative that contractual mechanisms continue to be followed to preserve your rights and remedies under the contract. And that includes complying with any notice requirements. And we've all been to a number of talks where legal representatives stress the importance of giving the right notice to the right person at the right time. And it's, I think it's very important that the JCT should emphasize that now because there is a danger that people um, forget to, to ensure that their rights under the contract are preserved at the same time as they're trying to deal with the ongoing impact of the pandemic and also to try and negotiate um, changes and to their contracts to ensure that all um, the best possible outcome is achieved. So SACI asked whether it's virtual business as usual. Um, I think it is to a large degree. Again, we're talking about the construction industry and disputes at least within uh, construction industry. And I think it's fair to say that for a fairly large degree, it is um, to some degree business as usual. Um, and that's down to the significant amount of effort from a very large, very wide um, group of people. I mean, perhaps the most important of those are those who work to keep our offices, courts, the tribunal rooms clean and so um, COVID secure. Um, but in the world of construction disputes, business is a lot closer to normal than I think certainly you might have predicted um, back in March. And there's a lot going on. I've, the LCIA rules have just come out. The JCT have just produced their, their note. Um, and reports keep coming on. I mean, do we want to talk about e-disclosure? Um, just two days ago, an update on the operation of the disclosure pilot scheme um, was um, produced. Um, but happily, I've run out of time. Happily for you, happily for me. So there's not time to go into um, e-disclosure in any detail. If you want to know more, um, please click on that link and we'll be sending you in the usual way a link to the slides and the webinar itself. Hopefully that will come out to you tomorrow. But I've come to an end of my talk and hopefully to stay less time to deal with one or two questions. Thank you, Jeremy. I, I think the, the fact that we've managed to weave e-disclosure and Lady Gaga into the webinar has, has just been fantastic. Um, Thank you, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everyone, for the fantastic questions that have been coming in. I think we do have time for for one or two. Um, I suppose um, you did just end on on disclosure, um, Jeremy, and there is a question here on on disclosure. So um, let me pick that one up. It says, "What's happened with e-disclosure or evidence over the past six months? Have there been any changes?" I, I'll take that one quickly. Um, I, I'd say I'm. The, the E in e-disclosure has been extremely helpful, electronic documents, electronic evidence. Um, so probably probably very few changes, um, possibly uh, some challenges with obtaining evidence in interesting places, remote places, um, uh, possibly a bit of a challenge every now and again, um, accessing the right um, staff on site or employees as it might be um, but on the whole probably not too much change um, we are seeing an increased use in the e-disclosure tools um, that are you know up and coming classification of images using ai and other machine learning um, what else can i say i mean dealing now that now the e-disclosure platforms you know incorporate um, such we can call them apps if you want to to deal with um, video footage with drones um, so you know a, a lot is up and coming and interesting I think there's taking you know more hold of that that now um, possibly a slightly separate issue um, well I think we'll leave disclosure at that one but because there's quite a few other questions but um, Jeremy turning to um, the courts adjudicators arbitrators uh, and there's a lot of questions on time here um, what are your thoughts possibly on parties requesting a further extension of time to submit witness statements if an employee 
um, is on furlough or there's possibly other issues. How do you think the courts or an adjudicator or an arbitrator might deal with that request? Uh, it may be different um, for courts and a arbitration tribunal. Um, I'll come to adjudication in a moment. Um, the courts, the the Z a practice direction enables courts to take account of the effects of the pandemic. One of the effects of the pandemic is that employees are on furlough. Um, furlough means not working. Um, and so that's an interesting thing about the question, which I certainly hadn't thought of until just this minute, as to whether providing witness evidence would actually be part of someone's day to day job. So it might actually be that you can't provide evidence, but that might be too technical a point. Um, the, the basic point is the courts expect parties, first of all, to have a degree of common sense in terms of timetabling. It's going, there are certain circumstances where it's going to be more difficult to obtain evidence, and one of those might be in relation to furloughing. Um, it's an interesting balance, isn't it? Because if you're on furlough, you might be said to have more time on your hands. Um, but the courts would not be unsympathetic to a properly made out application explaining why there is a need for extra time. And that's the key. All the cases I've talked about, whether it was the economic ones um, or other ones, um, what the courts are looking for, you can't just say, I want an extension of time because of the COVID-19 pandemic. You have to say, I want an extension of time because I need that time. And these are the four or five reasons why I need that time. With adjudicators, it's slightly different because you're much more constrained in terms of time because it's a quicker process. But again, when I've sat as a, an adjudicator and adjudicators have got to be prepared to take a reasonable, fair view about people wanting more time because of the difficulties of obtaining evidence in the current circumstances. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, and I hope I hope that um, I'd, I'd absolutely agree, and I hope um, that that answers our um, audience's questions for the moment. Um, just looking at the time, I I just want to let the audience know there's a couple of questions here on um, negotiating contracts um, with addressing COVID within those contracts, and I think rather than um, possibly dealing with them in the short amount of time we have, if I could point you to our website, um, all of these webinars are rec are recorded and we put them onto the website. So you can access them on demand. And our last webinar, which was on the 10th of um, September, dealt exactly with that, with negotiating contracts in light of COVID-19. Um, so for those those questions, if I could point you in that direction, that'd be fantastic. And then there are a, a couple of questions around more points on um, force majeure, um, change in law, foreseeability, things like that. Again, we've had a couple of webinars. Um, Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong. I think they were in April or May. Um, and June actually, um, specifically on that. And again, those are, are recorded and, and are on our website. Um, I think um, one last question possibly um, about turning more to the sort of face-to-face -face meetings. Um, um, now that there's less travel and less face-to-face -face meetings, have we seen any difficulties in, in how parties um, take advice from a solicitor, how they prepare for disputes or hearings. Um, are we seeing any differences or difficulties there? Um, I, do I, I don't think so. I mean, the thing is, that for, from a practical point of view, you've got to make do, you've got to make the best of what the uh, of what's in front of you. Um, the opportunities that you can speak in video conferencing like we are or like you might do through Zoom or Teams or Skype for business, um, that's a good thing. Um, sometimes it enables there to be more face-to-face -face conduct uh, contact, which is good. Um, you can have a, a you, you, instead of having one lengthy meeting where people aren't getting tired towards the end of it, as you might do face-to-face, -face, you might be able to schedule a series of short meetings so that it doesn't break so much into sort of people's days when you're preparing for a case. Um, so you've got to learn what works for you and what works for the client, um, and then come to the best solution. You know, sometimes the, the old tricks are as good. Um, I mean, I've, you referred, Stacey, to picking up a telephone. Um, picking up a telephone is good. Um, enables you to get up from your desk and get up from your virtual meetings and walk around the room whilst you're on the phone. Um, and that's meant to be good for all our, our well-being. Um, but you, you need to work out what works for you and much, much more importantly, work out 
what's best for the client. The, 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 what the great thing is about the variety of technology and stuff that's available now is that there are a lot of different ways of doing these things. And that's, you know, and explore the options and find out what's best for the people that you're working with. Um, in terms of hearings, um, the key advice is always be prepared. Um, and when it comes to virtual hearings, and, and if you're making a presentation, um, practice. It's a very odd thing to do to be giving evidence, to be making a presentation in a hearing when you're talking to a laptop. It's like talking to a mirror, it's talking to a goldfish bowl. That you, there's nothing to react against. So you do need to be prepared and you do need to practice. But that would be my, my, my two tips. Hmm. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, absolutely. And if I can just add, I mean, with some of the technology now and, and, and you know, collaborating in real time in documents, um, you know, I think we're only going to see the rise of that and some really interesting technology out there that um, I'm hopeful that, you know, people will become more familiar with as time goes on. So I think um, that's, pro that's probably all we have time for. Um, if I can say thank you, Jer Jeremy, very much for for, for, for introducing us to uh, Lady Gaga today and um, the, the fantastic um, case law that you've run through, obviously. Um, and just one final thing, um, and obviously thank you very much for everyone joining today. And if I can mark it, our next webinar, which is on the 8th of October, uh, two weeks time, Thursday, 12 o'clock, same time, we will have our senior partner, Simon Tolson, with us um, speaking. The details are yet to be finalized, um, but if you if you know Simon, it will absolutely be a riveting um, webinar. So please do join us then, 8th of October. And until then, um, please stay safe, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. <laughs>